Good afternoon. My name is Ranger Shelton Johnson. I'm a park ranger right here in Yosemite Valley. I've been a park ranger since 1987, starting out in Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone was followed by a, a, a tour of duty in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital, and that was followed by work as a ranger in Great Basin National Park, which at that time was the newest national park in the United States. But I'm here in Yosemite, in Yosemite Valley in particular, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, Buffalo soldiers, African-American soldiers who served in both Yosemite and Sequoia and protected uh, these parks as uh, some of the first park rangers anywhere in the world. And I get excited when I start talking about this history because it's more than history. What I mean by that is that history is usually conveyed as something that's static. It's just something in a, a moth-infested book sitting there doing nothing and no real work in the world itself. And history is far more than that. History is active, it's dynamic, it's an, there's an energy to it, especially when you're telling a story that excites you and excites the audience. This history literally blew my mind. I had no idea that 100 years ago, in 1899, 1903 and 1904, there were African-American soldiers serving in Yosemite and Sequoia National Parks as some of the first park rangers anywhere in the world. I mean, let me, let me really convey to you what that, what, how, how significant this is, because when they left the Sierra Nevada in 1904, there were only nine or ten other national parks in the entire world. I'll say that again. There were just a handful of other national parks in the entire world. And, and as startling information that that is, is just the thought that African-Americans today don't feel a natural connection to these spaces, these wilderness spaces, these wilderness places. They think it's something that's beyond their kinship, it's beyond their inheritance, it's beyond uh, who they are as human beings. And this history belies that. This history anchors them in this environment, which is the range of light. So this story was once forgotten. It has been re being remembered in the process of being remembered for over 20 years. And we're going to get into some of the details of this story. So let's start with the name. Buffalo Soldiers. They're called Buffalo Soldiers primarily because the 9th and 10th Regiments of Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Regiments of Infantry served during the Indian Wars. And in that service, the Plains Indians noticed that the hair on their heads was just like the matted cushion between the horns of the bison, and when they wore bison coats or, or jackets, the darkness of their skin and the darkness of those coats blended together in such a way that you could not separate the bison from the man. So that's when, when people think of Buffalo Soldiers, they're either thinking of Bob Marley or they're thinking of the, 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 the American West uh, and, and that time period during the Indian Wars. When they came here in 1899, Yosemite had its own Indian Wars. That involved the Mariposa Battalion in 1851. And sometimes people think that the Buffalo Soldiers were part of that battalion, but they were not. Uh, there was a difference of 50 years of time between uh, the Gold Rush and when the, the 24th Infantry arrived here in 1899. So they had nothing to do with that, but they did have to do with the genocide that took place during the Indian Wars during that frontier period. But here in Yosemite, it wasn't about fighting. Here in Yosemite, it wasn't about killing. Here in Yosemite, it was about saving, protecting, and nurturing the National Park idea itself. They were safeguarding an idea that has since their time spread all over the world. There's over 4,000 national parks around the world. But again, when they were here 100 years ago, there was only around 10. So why am I talking about this? Why does this have so much meaning to me? Well, let's look at my hat. This is the ranger hat. And when you look at a ranger hat or you look at anything in the world, sometimes all you see is what's there, what's presented before you. I look at this hat, I see history. I feel the texture of this hat and I feel history. And history to me is as tangible as this Stetson that I've been wearing since 1987. But no one told me when I worked at the west entrance to Yellowstone National Park back in 1987 that I was mirroring a stewardship role that was played by the Buffalo Soldiers when they were in Yosemite, when they were in Sequoia National Park. They staffed entrance stations. They invented the whole idea of the entrance station, not specifically the Buffalo Soldiers, but the army troops that served in the parks before the creation of the National Park Service. So when I was a ranger in Yellowstone in 1987, I would actually ask people if they had firearms, and if they did, the firearms needed to be rendered inoperative. You couldn't fire them. You had to separate the, the bullets or the shells away from the, the weapon itself, and they had to do that to prevent poaching. And I had no idea, no one told me when I was saying such a thing that I was actually mirroring, I was echoing what these soldiers had to do here in Yosemite National Park to keep the wildlife safe, to keep the deer from being hunted. 
that was one of the duties that these soldiers had to protect the wildlife and to protect the park, but more importantly, to also protect the idea of a national park. So we have to keep that in mind. National parks have not always been there in the world. National parks are an intellectual, spiritual invention, a different way of looking at the earth, a different lens to peer through and see a light that's always been there, but we as a culture have not noticed it until the 19th century when we began to realize that nature could stand on its own and, we, and it was not there to be despoiled. It was not there to take something from it. It was there for us to give something back and to receive something from it that would help us in the long run. We're talking about the 19th century. We're talking about the rise of a Romanticism. We're talking about a new way of being in the world, which happened in the 19th century. And that lens that we were now peering through at the world was such that we literally were awakened. And we had people like John Muir to aid us in that awakening, to see something that we would just walk by and not really notice the beauty that was at our feet, the beauty that was in the sky, the beauty that was all around us. Because we had such an acquisitive nature in the latter half of the 19th century that all we saw when we saw nature or we saw trees, as John Muir put it, we saw bored feet. We saw a mountain, we saw ore, we saw copper, we saw the, the raw ingredients to build a city, to build a civilization. So all of that began to shift in the latter half of the 19th century and the African American soldiers that served here in Yosemite in 1899, 1903, and 1904 were part of that equation. But here's the problem. They're African American and in those days they would have been called colored soldiers. And Colored people at that time were occupying the lowest rung of that ladder. So as a result, any of those soldiers telling any of the visitors who were mostly Euro-American what they could or could not do, well, that was an undertaking. That was a dangerous task in and of itself. So they had to be, there had to be something ambassadorial about their demeanor, about their character, to not give offense, even though they're there, to make certain that the rules and regulations that kept the park safe were being followed. So they were only here during the summer months because winter was another form of enforcement to keep the ne'er-do-wells from causing trouble for the park. But the military was here to enforce, really to safeguard a new idea. People sometimes ask me, so why was the army here? And it confuses them. Why the military? Because all of us have grown up watching movies. And often when you watch a movie, you're not getting the right information. Sometimes history is interpreted in such a way for dramatic purposes that the, the facts and that the truth can literally be hidden like these plants at my feet beneath the snow. So one of the facts that's important to keep in mind with regard to the Buffalo Soldiers is that they were not true Buffalo Soldiers in the sense that we think of because they never fought in the Indian Wars. But keep in mind that if you were a graduate of West Point Military Academy, and the officers who were in charge of these soldiers, these African-American soldiers, they were all graduates of West Point. And West Point was, was started by Thomas Jefferson, President Thomas Jefferson, 1803. He, it was started to create a cadre of engineers for the purpose of building a new nation. So think of the Louisiana Purchase. Think of Lewis and Clark. Think about all this territory that was to the west that was unexplored, that was occupied by millions of indigenous people at the time who had no idea that they might have been owned by France. How can you own something that you've never seen, that you've never touched? But that's how the world worked back then. And maybe it, it still works in a similar way, but I, I hope not. But, the, but what I'm saying is, is that that school created engineers because you need engineers to build a road. You need engineers to build a town. And most of America, by 1800, most of America was in the eastern seaboard, not in the western seaboard. So this gets to why the army was here, because people are always asking me, okay, so you got a new park, but why bring in the army? Because we've been so conditioned, as I said, to those westerns, we just think of a soldiers shooting, killing, fighting, that sort of behavior. And it's not behavior, it's, it's what they had to do, based on the time that they lived in. But the soldiers were also trained to understand the world that was around them, to understand the natural history that was around them. So if you were a graduate of West Point, you basically were an engineer. You understood the geology, you understood rocks, you understood soils, you understood plants, you understood birds and the importance of mammals and wildlife in general, because you had to report what you were finding on some exploratory journey in the American West, which is why so many of those journeys that we all know were led by Captain this, Colonel that, General that, because they were all graduates of West Point. They were schooled in that engineering capacity. 
So when they were out in the wild, they understood what it took to build a road through a roadless environment. They understood how much explosive you might need to use to blast the side of a mountain to clear it. They understood all those things because they had to because no road was there. And often we describe wilderness as a roadless area, which I find disturbing because there's so much more in a positive value to wilderness than the absence of a road. That absence does not literally to me communicate the light and the beauty and the transcendence of being in the mountains, of being in the desert, of being in a place where we are not in terms of our civilization. So the complication of race plays so much into this because when you look at 1903, 1904, 1899, this was the lowest point in terms of African American history. Uh, there was a historian by the name of Rayford Logan. He described it as the nadir of the African American experience. And when I read that, I remember thinking, how could this be the lowest point? What could be lower than slavery? And then I realized that if you were enslaved, well, you, there was no hope. If you were enslaved, there was a spiritual deprivation. You're thinking, my ancestors were enslaved, my descendants will be enslaved. There's no light to light up this dark, this dark space that I'm in. But if you've been granted freedom under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the Emancipation Proclamation, then you have that little flame of hope lighting the way. But if you have that little flame of hope and you see it dashed because of the black codes that came into effect after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, then that would lead to what Rayford Logan was suggesting. By 1900, that was the lowest point because now you had hope. You had this sense of things happening in a positive way, a better world being born, a sunrise that you could feel within your heart as well as see with your own eyes. But when that's dashed to the ground, that is low. And that's the time period, the exact time period that these soldiers served here in Yosemite and Sequoia. Most of them were from the deep south. Most of them, uh, there, there, were, there was no other type of occupation that would give them that same sense of dignity, that same sense of responsibility, and that same sense of respect. So I can see why these young African-American men who were the sons and grandsons of enslaved people, the sons and grandsons of, of sharecroppers, I can see why they gravitated to this. If you have that sense of dignity, if you have that sense of your own humanity, I can see why you might gravitate to something that fills you with respect and you emit that respect out into the world. So they came here and they were ready for this duty, but their story was forgotten. And that's the problem. The stories of women are often forgotten. The stories of people of color are often forgotten. Even though there are people within those communities who hold that torch up for people to see. But there is a reason why stories get lost. And that's why it's important, it's incumbent upon all of us to be part of that circle of light that brings these stories out of the darkness into a greater radiance. It's not just my responsibility to communicate the beauty of this history, the beauty of history itself. It's the responsibility of all of us to hold a candle, to light up the complexity, the richness of our past, the richness of our history, because this is a legacy that belongs not just to African-Americans. This is not just African-American history in Yosemite or African-American history in Sequoia. This is American history in the Sierra Nevada. This is important American history that is literally the legacy for every American. It belongs to you as much as it belongs to me, and it belongs to all of us, and it belongs to the world. Because these soldiers weren't just some of the first park rangers. They built the first trail to the top of Mount Whitney, which in that time was the highest mountain in the United States. Not the contiguous United States, in the entire United States, because we, Alaska was not a state at that time. These soldiers in Sequoia National Park built the first usable wagon road into Sequoia's giant forest. The entrance station, the whole idea of an entrance station was invented by the U.S. Army to collect firearms, to render them inoperative. So we forget that military legacy, but now and right now is the time to share that story, which is what I'm doing. These soldiers also in Yosemite in 1904, they built an arboretum. They built a trail on the South Fork of the Merced, not too far from here. And on this wooded slopes of, of the South Fork of the Merced, Along that trail, there were benches, and you could sit in these benches, and you'd look to one side or the other, and you'd see plants, and the plants were labeled in both English and Latin. Simple beginnings, but that area, that arboretum, which is what it's called, is now considered to be the first museum in the national park system. So think about it. They built the first trail to the highest mountain in the United States in Sequoia National Park, the first usable wagon road into Sequoia's giant forest under the tutelage and, and, and the, the, the power and grace of 
Charles Young. I have to slow my words because I don't want to rush past the significance of Charles Young, the third African American to graduate from West Point and the first African American superintendent of any national park in the United States. But under his tutelage, they built that trail to the top of Mount Whitney in Sequoia National Park. And even with all of that, they were forgotten. And that's why I'm here today, not to just give a message of what they did and the importance of what they did, but the importance that we all have in sharing the burden of keeping that story lifted up so all the light can touch it and that and it is lit up so that we can see and appreciate this story, not just today, but also tomorrow and in the days and years to come. This is not my story. This is our story. This is history that changed America that changed our parks and we should all be thankful that these soldiers were here because this hat that I'm holding right here this is not just a ranger hat this is a cavalry hat and this casts a small shadow on the earth but that shadow is big enough to cover the whole thing so thank you for listening it's African American History Month I hope you enjoyed what I had to say and remember history is mostly forgotten. It's our job to bring it into the light. Every story deserves to be heard.